What it do, I'm Lumi and welcome to The Bench Top, the science show where we explore our plastic planet. This episode is in collaboration with my friends over at Biozone. Make sure you check out their video right up there or down in the description. Now it's no secret that plastics have been a global problem for some time now. If you didn't know, we are currently in a plastics pandemic, which you can find out more in a previous video I made also right up there. Up until now, the main way to combat our plastics problem has been through recycling, since reduce and reuse cannot be found in the human vocabulary. But it turns out that recycling in theory and in practice are two different things. Though many plastics can be recycled under the right conditions, the reality is that most plastic products just can't be recycled in a way that's actually useful. The truth is different plastics usually can't be recycled with each other, and in some places, plastics aren't accepted at all. The plastic recycling system is a mess, and unfortunately, that means that many plastic items just end up in a landfill or in our oceans. However, PET might become the exception. PET is one of the most common and versatile types of plastics we use. Formerly called polyethylene terephthalate, PET is used to make all types of things from carpets to bottles to engine covers. Like all polymers, PET is made of many smaller molecules called monomers. In the case of PET, it's actually two different monomers, dimethyl terephthalate and ethylene glycol. These two can react with each other through what's known as an esterification reaction, which means that PET is a polyester polymer. Now, I know that was a lot of jargon, but I promise to speak in plain English for the rest of the episode. As far as polymers go, PET is pretty basic, like mint flavored gum or pumpkin spice lattes. But there are other flavors of PET which give it some interesting new properties. But speaking of properties, the reason why PET is so widely used is because it's quite versatile. For example, PET is a great barrier for water and gases. This makes it perfect for things like soda bottles because they won't lose their fizz when shipped or shaken. That's why most liquid containers are indeed made out of PET. Other benefits of PET are it's cheap, strong, transparent, and unreactive, which was perfect for food packaging. This means you can shop with your eyes and judge the quality of the food before buying, you can throw it in your bag and not think twice about it breaking, and when you finally get home to eat it, it tastes just like how you expect it to, with no plasticky or chemical flavors. This is why PET is one of the most prevalent plastics used throughout your local grocery store. In fact, the next time you go to the grocery store, I challenge you to see if you can avoid buying a PET container at all. Now, though PET is considered to be 100% recyclable, there are a few issues. Whenever a polymer is recycled, they don't always hold the same properties. When PET is recycled, it gets turned into flakes, which are processed and sorted into what's called high-grade and low-grade PET. The high-grade stuff is what's used for making new PET bottles and food containers, since it still has the right properties. But the low-grade flakes are downcycled into things like carpets, clothing, and outdoor furniture. The low-grade PET that isn't downcycled is usually just thrown in a landfill, and let's be honest, the carpet and outdoor furniture isn't far behind. So though PET is technically 100% recyclable, in reality, 100% of it isn't recycled. In other words, we don't really turn one bottle into another bottle. It just doesn't work that way. All that PET that gets thrown in a landfill is chemically inert, which means that mound of PET is effectively here to stay. And that's a problem since PET is one of the most widely used polymers in the world. In North America alone, we produce 3.1 million tons of PET each year. In order to reduce the amount of PET that ends up in landfills, we need a way to turn all that low-grade PET into high-grade PET. But that sounds impossible, right? How can we make PET infinitely reusable? Well, one way is by using biology rather than just chemistry. Isn't biology just life chemistry? No, it's all just physics, which I guess is just math. So everything is math. We're using math. Remember that PET is made of dimethyl terephthalate and ethylene glycol, just like I have here. Now, if I wanted to completely recycle this material, what I want to do is separate this long chain back into its building blocks. This process is called depolymerization. Now, doing this chemically usually results in a huge mess, and we don't really have a good tool to reliably break polymers back into their building blocks. Except we do. They're called enzymes. Enzymes can be found in the cells of living organisms and are like biological factory machines, turning one compound into another. 
In fact, enzymes are so sophisticated that they can recognize specific individual molecules or even specific sites along a polymer chain. And after recognition, they can convert one compound into another, they can join multiple compounds together, or even cut them apart. I think you see where this is going. <laughs> In 2012, scientists out of Osaka University discovered an enzyme called leaf branch compost cutinase that could break down PET into its monomers. That's wild. Nature made an enzyme that could eat plastic. If you want to know more about how an enzyme could evolve to eat plastic in such a short amount of time, check out Biozone's video linked right up there or down in the description. LBCC is a type of enzyme called an esterase, which means it breaks down ester bonds. Ester bonds are made through the reaction of an alcohol and a carboxylic acid and like this. Seem familiar? Esterases are able to break these types of chemical bonds and turn polymers back into their building blocks, but some do this better than others. Though esterases have been well studied, finding ones that specifically break down PET are rare. In 2016, scientists out of Kyoto University found a bacterium that could use PET as its main food source. This bacterium used a two enzyme system to break down PET into its monomers and extract energy from it. This system became known as PET hydrolase or PETase for short. It was an enzyme that could not only break down PET, but preferred it. So what's the catch? Why can't we just put a bunch of this bacterium in a landfill and problem solved? Well, nothing in life is ever that simple. Just because PETase can break down PET into its monomers doesn't mean you want monomer soup just sitting out there. These monomers aren't good for the environment either and can still have a negative effect on plants, wildlife, and us. Additionally, PETase isn't even the best version of itself. Shortly after its discovery, scientists started tinkering with PETase, making it even faster at breaking down PET. Then they noticed that adding in a second enzyme known as metase made the process two times faster. Since then, scientists have continued modifying PETase to increase its efficiency to where it's now capable of breaking down PET to its monomers in just a few days. However, this is still too slow from a commercial standpoint. By 2022, it's estimated that the world will be producing 87 million tons of PET every year. That's almost 250,000 tons every day. So can enzymes really keep up? Well, companies like Carbios think they can at least make a dent. Carbios is planning the launch of one of the first industrial scale demonstrations of biorecycling PET later this year. And it will be the first real test in the feasibility of using enzymes to eat away our plastic problem. Though I'm not affiliated with Carbios in any way, I do hope this pans out for the sake of our planet. Otherwise, Earth really will become the first plastic planet. But with synthetic plastics only being around for just over 100 years, it's really cool that nature has already designed a way to use it to keep the earth going. If you want to learn more about how this bacterium came to be, check out this video from Biozone where they explain how PETase likely evolved. I'm Lumi. Thanks for coming to the Benchtop. I'll see you in the next one. And remember, keep thinking.